be it mishandling, mismanagement, or just good old-fashioned taking your ball and going home with it, I have for you today three more games that met an early death. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Folks, welcome to the Rat Stream. My name is Big Iron Rat, and if you don't know already, I specialize in snapback hats and hot takes that are deemed... Well received. Anyway, uh, for those that don't already know and haven't already seen the last video before this was uh, three games that had died. Um, I'm going to kind of keep that ball rolling because I, after doing a few bits of research, I ended up going down quite the bunny trail. So I figured I'd keep it going and show you guys three more games today that have died. Um, now bear in mind, this is not just restricted to live service now at this point. The restriction was live service for my last video. It is not the same restriction in this video. In this video, we're just going to cover any good old fashioned possible sequel that may have come out, a live service game, or even an entire franchise that burned to the ground due to whatever reason. But, uh, but yeah, with, uh, with, uh, that mentioned and everything else, uh, let's get started, shall we? Let's start with our first game. Enter Fez, a 2012 indie puzzle platformer crafted by Polytron Corporation and released under the banner of Trapdoor. In this intricate game, players step into the shoes of Gomez, who after acquiring a mystical Fez, witnesses the transformation of his seemingly two-dimensional world into one of four facets with three-dimensional realms. The gameplay involves navigating between these four 2D perspectives to manipulate platforms and solve puzzles all with the ultimate goal of collecting cubes and cube fragments to restore equilibrium to the universe. See, Fez earned its stripes as an underdog darling of the indie game scene during its extended and high profile five year development. The figurehead behind this adventure is Phil Fish, the designer of Fez and the founder of Polytron. Phil Fish gained notoriety not just for his design prowess, but he also for his outspoken public persona thrust into the spotlight after the uh, 2012 indie game movie documentary, uh, which chronicled the final stages of Fez's development and Polytron's legal tribulations. Okay, so upon its release in Xbox Live Arcade in April 2012, Fez garnered critical acclaim for its emphasis on exploration and player freedom. Uh, it later found its way to other platforms after the conclusion of a year-long exclusivity agreement with uh, Microsoft. While reviewers lauded the game's focus on discovery, they did not shy away from critiquing the technical issues, in-game navigation challenges, and end-game backtracking. The rotating mechanics of Fez drew comparisons to the 2D, 3D transitions uh, seen in other games like Echo Chrome, Nebulous, Super Paper Mario, and uh, even Crush. Despite the critiques, though, uh, Fez stood out as a winner. It secured awards such as the Samus McNally Grand Prize and Eurogamer's 2012 Game of the Year. Uh, by the close of 2013, though, it had sold nearly 1 million copies and left an undeniable, or an undeniable rather, mark uh, in history. Uh, and it actually paved the way for games like Monument Valley, Crossy Roads, that sort of thing. Uh, however, the anticipated sequel to Fez met an unfortunate fate when Phil Fish abruptly and unexpectedly decided to exit the game development scene. Oh yeah, sure. Sure, sure. I mean, everyone quits their job from time to time. Makes sense. Uh, except this one is really, really, really just petty. And that's the only way I can describe this. So, here's how this goes. See, Phil had become such a notable star after the documentary that everything he said was leaned on hard. Journalists made sure to sp spend a uh, appropriate amount of time focusing in on his words and one of his words were choice about the policy change for Xbox Live and how most indie developers had to go through a third party in order to self-publish onto Xbox Live. They couldn't simply just publish themselves. Uh, Fish had a problem with this, and he uh, stated so and spammed his Twitter as much. 
when a journalist by the with the last name Beers ended up, uh, inter, you know, asking questions about these things and kind of putting him under the fire when it in terms of what his mentality was about it. They got into a heated Twitter battle, to which ended with him simply saying, "There is not going to be a Fez Part Two, and I quit the gaming industry." And that was that. No, I'm I'm serious. That was that. He canceled his game even before his production company knew he was doing it. He quit the gaming industry and went radio silent since. Anytime someone brings up the game or the Twitter argument, he mentions that it was not this fight in particular, but all sorts of other fights as well. I guess he was just having a moment and decided to end his entire career? I don't know. Maybe it was a popularity. Either way, since then we have not seen Fez Part 2, and we will not see Fez Part 2. All because he simply got pushed and the limelight was simply too bright, or some shit. Next one really hits close to home for me because I was a big fan of this series and the idea that it came up and even had so much of it already built only for it to be taken away from me in the prime of its life. I think that's what bothers me most. And so without further ado, let's talk about... Now this one's one of my personal favorites. This entire series is amazing. Um, and it was just because it was uh, just uh, something a touch different from the traditional Mega Man and Mega Man X's. And I had grown up with Mega Man 1 through 6 on Nintendo playing it religiously. Uh, so when Mega Man Legends came out and I got to see what it looked like when he was in a sort of 3D adventure, it was chef's kiss. It was amazing. Um, the the fan base was fairly popular as well. People wanted to see more of it. We even got a Misadventures of Tron Bond game as well as a Mega Man Legends 2. And that's kind of where it died off until in a candid May 2007 interview with 1up.com God, I haven't heard that name in forever. Uh, KG and Afune, the Lord Almighty of everything Mega Man, disclosed the interest of the original team members from the Mega Man Legends series in developing Mega Man Legends 3. Uh, they were even contemplating using the use of MT Framework Engine, uh, which would be a major step up in technology uh, compared to the previous. Months later, responding to the fans' queries about the prospect of Mega Man Legends 3, Inafune expressed his personal desire to undertake such a project, but uh, acknowledged the infeasibility at the moment, unfortunately. But the big reveal at the New York Comic Con later in October 2010, uh, they detailed information of Mega Man Legends 3 uh, there, and that's where everything came to surface. Capcom, amid its development, decided to involve the community by allowing fans to shape aspects of the game. Uh, this interactive endeavor led to the introduction of new elements, including the character Arrow, a mechanical marvel, and also tweaks to Mega Man's overall design. ...was simply cut. It was simply canceled. Uh, now, there is speculation as to what could have caused this. There is speculation as to why this happened, even with so much work done on the game. Uh, the largest consensus seems to be that the Mega Man craze uh, had dwindled to next to nothing. Uh, KG, after KG left, he was the only thing holding Mega Man close to Capcom's heart. And once he left, they kind of gave up on Mega Man altogether. Uh, the team itself kept working studiously up until the, the zero hour in which they said, no, you know, we're not going to make it. And it got thrown in the wind. Uh, nothing more has been mentioned about uh, Mega Man Legends since. Before I get to my uh, third game here, I just want to take time to remind you all that I do have a Discord down listed below where the description is and everything. You will find everything ranging from my TikToks, which I've just started making more shorts again, as well as 
on YouTube, uh, my Discord, and even better yet, my Patreon. Uh, for those who don't already know, my Patreon comes with a number of great perks, but the most important perk is you and I talk one-on-one -on -one about my content as a whole. I'll open up chat rooms and special perks like hangouts and things like that later down the line. But right now, I want to hear from people who are absolutely going to throw down some cash for the almighty uh, riot over here who needs the help, I'll tell you what. But uh, anybody coming through for me, I definitely want to hear back from you, especially if you believe in the cause that much. And so far, it's been good, and I've been met with a number of great criticisms, and I appreciate every one of you wholeheartedly for giving me advice on how to keep doing this. Because in the end, I'm not going to get better unless you guys tell me what you're looking for. I can guess or pretend I know shit about shit but in the end nobody knows shit about shit but anyway let's get on to the third game shall we moving on it was august 12th 2014 and a new demo had arrived called pt no one knew what it was but they played it and sure enough it was something akin to a first person survival horror game the only catch was you were trapped in the same endless loop over and over and over. Different things changed, sure. You saw little stray differences, but nothing too crazy until you started hearing things, until you started seeing things watching you, until things started closing the door on you. But as you went further and further down, you lived that sweet, sweet horror life by making sure that you went through every scary thing you could, scaring your friends, showing everybody the demos, just living it up. And it was good. And it was good. You finally reach this endless, endless labyrinth, wondering when it all is going to end, and you finally realize you've reached the end. You're, you say to yourself, did I beat the game? Is this it? Is this how it goes? And you start to notice some key things about this. For starters, the graphics look amazing. For a game that looked like it was going to be some sort of indie horror, all of a sudden it really worked out. But then Hideo's name shows up. Now everyone's going, okay, wait, what? What is Hideo doing? This is far too modern for him. There's not enough nude women and robots fighting each other. And then Guillermo del Toro. One of the fabled directors, number of different creative projects he's done, award winning, good stuff going down. And then you get Norman fucking Reedus popping in. At this point, everybody's mouth is dangling open. No one knows what the fuck is going on. I, for one. I, as, as I'm watching, I was like, oh, this game is this game is cool, but what is with all these all-star cast people? I don't get it. And then you get the wonderful title that says Silent Hill. It pauses for a little suspense and adds an S, implying there's more than one Silent Hill. Now. We could have had the most interesting, by far, version of Silent Hill we've ever seen. Possibly. But we'll never know. Why we'll never know? Well, that's very easy. See, Konami and Hideo, as you, I'm sure you're aware of now, uh, had a bit of infighting. Uh, they creative differences, I believe they call it. Um, but I tend to disagree. It's not necessarily creative differences, but it's more along the lines of... Konami believes in their money and they go where the money goes. They make decisions based on their money. Hideo makes decisions based on fever dreams he's had last night in which he was riding a flower through a freeway in Chicago. There is a, there is a long-winded battle going on uh, behind the scenes that the fans are not privy to when it comes to Hideo and Kojima, but here's... I can tell you what it ended with. I can tell you how it ended. Metal Gear Solid The Phantom Pain was one of the last games he had a chance to really work on and try to finish, which he did not finish. Not only that, they removed his name from the credits and they removed it from the covers of every box art that they sold. Petty. Okay? After that, they canceled Silent Hills. Altogether, they said, no, we're just not doing it. Fuck off. And, th and that was kind of it. And then after that, Hideo walked his separate ways. He simply went on into the distance, and we never got to see what would become of PT. Now, there have been a shit ton of clones, don't get me wrong. There have been a number of different Easter eggs, and even more so people trying feverishly to, to remake this and capture lightning in a bottle, but it can't be done is the point. So... The biggest hit we'll take in all of this is that Silent Hills could have been made, not only could it have been made, could it, but it could have saved Silent Hill. 
Instead, we had to wait for their new Redo Redo, a lineup of games including Silent Hill Ascension, the Silent Hill 2 Remake, Silent Hill Townfall, Silent Hill F, Silent Hill The, the Last Night, uh, Silent Hill Electric Boogaloo. They're going down the list. One of them's got to take because... To be fairly honest, every plan after Silent Hill sounds like a plan B for Silent Hill. So, that being said, uh, this one absolutely infuriated me. I was livid. One, because no one could get a straight answer of why Hideo was even leaving. They couldn't get a straight answer. People can speculate, and even I speculated. I have a few videos actually covering that speculation. But this is something else entirely. Konami went for the went for the jugular on purpose. Now I don't know if it's because Hideo did one too many bad things or they were just tired of his rock star lifestyle. I don't know. I have no earthly idea. But here's what I do know. This is what we're left with. So just because a game is cancelled or a sequel is cancelled doesn't mean it won't be coming back. However, that the same thing can be said for if a game is returning. I'm not so sure it's going to be a sequel or even remotely considered to be part of what it already was. For instance, Silent Hill Ascension. We got a sequel sequel and they even say it's canon. I fail to see how anything can be canon if we're all voting on it, but whatever, I digress. That's what we're dealing with now. And it sucks and I hate it. But I think you guys already knew that, personally. And that was Three Dead Games. Folks, I can't thank you again, and I cannot thank you enough. Uh, the viewers and subscribers I've had in the last two months have been just absolutely fucking motivating and inspiring. Uh, I'll be partnered in no time. In the meantime, every last one of you guys, you have my, my, my absolute love. If you have any comments for me, you disagree, you have any games you want me to bring up in my next uh, Dead Games uh, video, which I think I may hang on to. I think I'm starting to like this series a little bit. Uh, if you uh, have any game ideas, go ahead and throw them down on the list, uh, and uh, we'll see where we go from there. But in the meantime, make sure you like and subscribe. That's the only way you're going to see me again. Be on the lookout for some shorts that I may post within the uh, week as well. And as always, thank you for my patrons, who without them, I would not be able to keep doing what I am doing. You'll find them right here on this part of the screen. If you want to find yourself on part of the screen, why don't you pop over to Patreon, where for $3 a month, which is a not even Netflix at this point, you can uh, obtain yourself some sweet, sweet goodness that is, I don't know, I lost what I was going to say, but you know it's going to be good. Anyway, uh, that's it for me. Much love to everybody else, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Okay, okay, all right, all right, all right. I get it, I get it, I get it. I, obviously, some of my hot takes are a little spicier than others, and you're going to want to argue with me, especially if you're a fan of the game. That makes sense. Let's, uh, let's take five, okay? Let's just uh, stick with the facts then. Uh, let's, uh, let's list all the game's obituary style and how they died. More specifically, let's talk about the live service games that died and how. I mean, they, they all can't be bangers, right? They're, at least they're not supposed to be anyway. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Folks, what's happening? My name is Big Iron Riot. Welcome to the Riot Stream, where I talk about things that get your blood boiling and pumping a little bit. Maybe some of you want to argue. Maybe some of you want to agree. I don't know. Don't care. Doesn't matter. I'm going to speak my voice, and it's going to say things and words, and then sometimes, hit or miss, we move on. Today, we're going to be talking about live service games that died, unfortunate deaths left in a ditch somewhere or behind a barn, which you had to shoot with your uncle. There were many tears. But it had to be done, and there are reasons why. I will explain those very reasons, and we're just going to jump right into it in a, in a nice little formulaic style. No real number system. I'm just going to go down the list, and uh, these will be obtained from a number of different sources. I'll list some down in the comments below, but if uh, you remember a live service game that died that I did not list here, be sure to talk about that. And uh, any fans that still played or hung on to the hope that the game would come back, I want to hear from you too.
but uh, the point of all this is to kind of go over the fact that the live service model while cheaper and easier to produce it's something that companies will make in mass to make sure that they can collect as much of those uh, gamer doubloons and if they don't collect the gamer doubloons then they simply pack it up make a new live service game and try again until one of them's a banger if at least one Fortnite can sustain about 10 different failures and they do intend on making that happen no matter who the company is hey kids you like final fantasy you like mario kart why not have both of them combined to make yourself a nice little Mario Kart clone out of all your Final Fantasy beloved characters that everyone knows so well? Doesn't it sound great? Doesn't it? Doesn't it? Doesn't it? Fine. Okay. That's what they did. Square Enix decides, hey, you know what? Uh, we're going to go ahead and make ourselves a good old-fashioned uh, Mario Kart clone. See what happens. Results were fine, I guess. They were okay. People had their ups and downs, and like any other kart racer, it couldn't be the GOAT that is Mario Kart. But there was always second best, and uh, this was close. This was close. Um, but for a lifespan of nine months, what went wrong? Well, I'll tell you what went wrong. Uh, the $50 price tag for the game was one thing. Yeah, at least it wasn't 60 right? I mean, it could have been a hell of a lot worse. It could have been 80 as mentioned in my video before. Check that out when you get a chance. But there was also the fact that the Battle Pass was a thing in this game. Now, this was not becoming of a Square Enix game number one. People usually got their game and maybe a little DLC thrown in the mix, but that was kind of it. Oh, this one went full mobile game as it threw you into a battle pass as well as just straight price gouging when it came to the DLC. And just to give you a little bit of uh, a little, little point of reference here, uh, characters like Cloud and Leon went for about $10 a pop after using enough coins or doubloons to buy yourself mithril crystals you would then spend ten dollars per character now this is a kart racer this is not an rpg as square enix is used to this is something of a you sit on your toilet kind of game in play so people were mad people were mad enough that the game sales dropped and the live service model failed overall it was not bringing in the money they anticipated and because it did not bring in the money it anticipated after nine months the game was cancelled all services rendered up till that point would be for free as long as you purchase the game outright for fifty dollars essentially it was supposed to be that way from the start they chose to wait until it had no way of squeezing any uh any money out of this rock and once that was done square enix decided okay now you can get the full game in its entirety and that's what they did they also terminated services uh beyond that point as well so there are no new current updates as well as any sort of events or anything like that You know what, shit, while we're on the subject of Square Enix and while this game started off in the hands of Square Enix, or more importantly, Crystal Dynamics, uh, by the end of its lifespan, it had shifted completely um, and ownership had changed hands once more. But uh, let's talk about... Okay, so I will be the first in line to tell you that I was hyped for this game. The idea that Square Enix, Crystal Dynamics, uh, subsidiary or a company owned by Square Enix was making a Marvel Avengers game. I lost my shit. As an avid Marvel fan, I was ready for it. You guys see the uh, Infinity Gauntlet up there and everything like that. It's like... You know what? Hang on real quick. That was the first one lined up for an Avengers game. I was like, holy shit, I'm going to get a game and it's going to be made by competent people. It's not going to be some weird license thing. I, w I did not want to see that. So the fact that Square Enix was taking over and I was absolutely head over heels for this company, as I've always been. Still to this day, to be fairly honest, if we're, if we're being 100% here. But And then I played the game. And then the world played the game. And they found out a few things. See, on the outset, the game looked good. I mean, it's noticeable that a number of different characters didn't share their uh, Hollywood counterparts. But who cares? There are worse things in life. Um, 
the game looked absolutely breathtaking in terms of appearance. Uh, the problem came more from the core mechanics of the game or the lack thereof. You see, while this uh, could be considered a looter shooter without the shooting part, maybe a looter basher, however you want to put it, however you want to take it, or whatever clinical category they have for it, people started to notice that the levels were relatively the same. Even with the combination of all these heroes at the same time, you were still met with the same back and forth. You were still met with the same beat up people go to target, beat up people go to place, beat up people go to other place. Uh, top that with the fact that the level cap seemed to be very very easy to conquer even square enix realized that there was an error in just how many people were actually running through the game and so quickly so what they do they changed the level cap they not only change the level cap but they also decrease the amount of experience giving forcing you to grind that much more believing this would increase the longevity of their game this did not increase the longevity of the game and after about two months the population showed a serious decline uh, and then after about two years, they decided to cut their losses after pushing out as much DLC as possible, that including Black Panther and Spider-Man. Spider-Man taking an absurd amount of time to get done. People were clamoring for it, despite the fact that the game was floundering. They said, please, please, please give me Spider-Man. Square Enix finally did it. However, it was a day late and a dollar short as the game just could not push the numbers anymore. People refused to do the same monotonous bash the aim or Hydra goons over and over and over. And eventually the game fell into obscurity and was it was boring. It was absolutely boring. For a game that looked so good, people expected better, and they expected better from a license that produced top-tier movies and things of that sort. And instead, what they got was a brawling beat-em-up. A brawling beat-em-up with the loot mechanics of Destiny. Okay, so this next one, I actually much like the rest of us suckers out there i shelled out for the special edition like the gold platinum tournament edition pro dual max whatever uh and played it day one and i think i had the same response everybody had day one um the only problem was this was the beginning of the end for me when it came to buying into hype on games and marketing campaigns uh this was the beginning cyberpunk was the end um but i don't think i've recovered from that since to be fairly honest but i think it's about time we bring up okay what you have to understand about this game anthem is that it was five to ten years in the making before it even came out it had been in production and developmental hell for some time uh bioware sat on it while they continued to make their other games games you know like dragon age and and mass effect and things like that and <clears throat> all the while they sat on this game adding pieces to it here and there but not really doing anything with it um this this only started gaining traction and momentum once EA had purchased Bioware outright. Now, EA is quite infamous for being EA. It's its own meme, really. It, and rightly so. EA is not exactly the most uh, user or consumer-friendly company. They kind of just push stuff out and see what bites and destroy everything else, including their own companies, to which they'll cannibalize after they purchase if they don't produce results after the first or second game. That being said, Q Anthem. Anthem comes in, and Anthem looks on paper and on trailer to be amazing. You know, with the popularity of Destiny and the hype of Iron Man films, the idea of flying around in a suit of armor just sounds like it'll be a wonderful prospect. And when it comes from a titan like Bioware, you're immediately piqued because you say, okay, so the story, the story without question is already going to be immaculate. We already know this. They, they made Dragon Age and Mass Effect. They might have a problem with the endings of certain stories, but we'll let that go. Um, 
but you already knew the story was going to be pristine. So how does the game look? Well, next you'll have to take a look at the trailers and take a look at the screenshots, and then you're convinced off of that. Up until the game actually releases any sort of beta that some people can actually gain access to while others cannot before the game even came out certain people explained that they were locked in loops that would have them load forever others explained that this simply couldn't make it out of the game there were series of glitches you know basic stuff stuff that even even now to this day happens with even the best of games so you kind of just let it go but the problem was people had spent so much money on these pre-orders and special editions that they expected to have the sunday best and they did not at all so the game comes out and myself included in the story we play day one only to find it's filled with th probably the most boring plot line i've ever heard in my life i could not recite it to you right now mainly because the only talking done was from people looking at you and kind of just jabbering at the jaw after about the fourth person to speak to me i started skipping dialogue on the first day and I thought it was just me. I thought it was just me. I was like, okay, maybe I'm just, I don't have the attention span for it. You know what I mean? Maybe, maybe that, no, no, no. Those that had dove into the lore and actually got, tried to, tried to hang with it. They were met with the same results I had. The story was boring. It was God awful. It was not of the caliber Bioware had done in the past. And it was confusing to people. We didn't understand. How is this possible? How are you, how are you not presenting top tier fucking storytelling? You're Bioware, for God's sake. Did anybody play Jade Empire? I'm not the only one. I know you're out there. Leave a comment if you play Jade Empire. So, such a good game. Such a good game. So, <clears throat> mix that with the fact that if you went into the... If you went into the actual shop, uh, yeah, you can buy certain items, but for the most part, to keep yourself from looking mundane like everybody else, you had to do microtransactions. Now, I don't mind microtransactions in the game, fine. If it's how you want to secure the bag, by all means, go ahead and do your thing. However, they were giving they were giving microtransactions to colors. Like, the, you want to be uh, deep red, or do you want to be a black color? Yeah, that'll run you about 100, you know, coins or crystals or whatever the fuck he was using back then. It was bad. It was bad. And more importantly, you want to talk about Avengers posting nothing when it comes to quest lines and things like that. You were in such a video game loop that eventually you were like, I'm just going to play the same mission a thousand times over and collect my armor that way because this is not working out. The level construction and everything in between, while beautifully built, was the most boring I have seen in some time. After playing it within a day, I've realized they were trying to become a Destiny competitor, only to be met with the worst kind of reception because on all fronts, after day one, I never touched the game again, and neither did a lot of people. And EA, because EA applies pressure to people like Bioware since they own them now, Bioware has to stand in the background and take the lashings while they figure out how the hell to get this thing done. EA does not fuck around. EA will wait for you to make money, and if you do not make that money, they will absolutely just consume you into their chest, and then your soul will float around in some pool where I'm sure Hades guards it or something, and EA will just control all the souls for all eternity. And if you think I still took that from a Disney movie or Mortal Kombat, you're very, very incorrect. Also bear in mind that during the course of this game's production, Bioware is essentially bleeding out. All their best people, all their best and brightest, their gold star card holders, their veterans were all leaving for one reason or another. Working under EA was an absolute nightmare. And so so the, the forefathers of Bioware broke off in different directions, making their own production teams or joining other uh, uh, developers altogether. So you've got everybody who, uh, prospectively, they, they made anthem what it was they, they started it off and now you have whatever's left not to mention you now have ea yelling and barking down the back of their necks while they're trying to make the game so you have the need for money to be made or else papa ea over there is just going to lose his absolute mind it was already a recipe for disaster and it showed because by the time everything was all said and done the game was doa and i think everyone knew it
right guys that was uh three games three live service games that met an untimely demise uh if you guys like me listing off games and how they died and the explanations behind them please by all means mention it in the comments in the meantime i'm getting the hell out of dot oh look i get to start my video and here we have once again steve steve get off my desk hey out you go can 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 you not Bro. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. We're good. 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 Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this episode of Three Games features a special guest. I am a personal fan. I've been watching him since time began. So to reach out and actually have him reach out and return the favor, I, I'm excited. I'm juiced. Uh, anyway, let's go ahead and get the ball rolling, shall we? Ever since video games were a thing, advertisements for interactive adventures have come in all manner of varieties. In the 90s, adverts were shown to display the edgy extreme side of things, while in the later years, we were introduced to engines, graphical capabilities, and cinematics that won't look out of place in an IMAX theater. However, what happens when everything seen in the adverts or interviews are not exactly as promised? In this episode of Three Games, we are covering these androgynous adverts, these pretensive promises, and these laughable lies. As I say. But, hello you. I'm Guru Larry, and this is Three Games Promised versus What We Got. Fable 2 released upon the gaming world in 2008, was heralded as a sequel to Lionhead Studios' innovative action RPG, promising to travel players to the immersive world of Albion where their choices would sculpt the world around them. Led by the visionary Peter Molyneux, known for his grandiose ambitions, the game was anticipated to revolutionise the RPG landscape. However, upon its release, Fable 2 was met with disappointment as many of the grand promises failed to materialise, leaving players to grapple with a game that fell short of its own hype. These included broken promises such as dynamic world simulation. Promise! Fable 2 was marketed as a game where player actions will dynamically shape the world, influencing everything from NPC behaviour to the growth and evolution of towns and cities. Reality! While some semblance of consequence was present, the impact of player choices felt superficial and limited. Changes to the world lack depth and failed to significantly alter gameplay dynamics. Promise! The game touted a robust combat system, featuring fluid and dynamic battles with a plethora of weapons, spells and abilities for players to master. Reality! Combat mechanics proved to be simplistic and repetitive, lacking the depth and complexity promised. The touted variety of combat options felt constrained and failed to offer the depth expected. Promise! Fable 2 boasted an innovative expression system, allowing players to interact with NPC through gestures and expressions, perpetually influencing their behaviour and relationships. Reality! While the expression system added a layer of charm, its impact of gameplay was minimal. Interactions were often reduced to binary choices with little lasting consequence, failing to deliver on the promised depth of NPC interaction. Promise! The game hinted at a narrative that would dynamically respond to player decisions, offering multiple branching paths and endings. Reality! Despite promises of reactive narrative, the storyline felt linear and lacked meaningful divergence based on player choices. Endings were largely predetermined, diminishing the sense of agency promised to players. Promise! Fable 2 suggested a deep character progression system, 
allowing players to customise their hero's appearance, abilities and alignment with unprecedented depth. Reality Character development, while present, felt shallow and limited. Customisation options were comparatively sparse and the impact of player choices on character development felt inconsequential failing to deliver the promised depth of customization and alignment influence. In retrospect, Peter Molyneux has acknowledged the disparity between the ambitious promises made during Fable 2's development and the realities of its execution. He has cited various challenges inherent to the game's development, including time constraints, technical limitations, and the difficulty of realising lofty design aspirations as contributing factors to the game's failure to fully deliver on its promises. Special shout out to Larry for uh, getting us started here. I really do appreciate that. And if you do have a minute, make sure you go and uh, give him a uh, subscription. You won't regret it. The man is filled with video game knowledge. Part of the inspiration behind what I do. So, Aliens, let's talk about Aliens Colonial Marines. Uh, it was released in 2013. Uh, it emerged onto the gaming scene with promises of a thrilling first-person shooter experience set in the iconic Alien universe. So it was destined to be great. It was destined to have a following. It was destined to just do well by numbers alone. Developed by Gearbox Software, you know them as the uh, developers of Borderlands and things like that, and published by Sega, the game was marketed with tantalizing previews and trailers showcasing intense battles against the Xenomorph Menace. However, upon release, players were confronted with a stark contrast between the promises made and the disappointing realities that awaited them. I don't know if you know this, but one of the biggest promises were the faithful adaptation of the source material itself. Aliens is a massive franchise, and it has, to this day, still movies being made, as well as fans clamoring to see something new. So when you tell them you're making a new game and it will follow the source material to the letter, you better make sure that everything's 100% accurate. And that's what they promised, that it would be. However, in reality, despite the promises of authenticity, Aliens Colonial Marines diverge significantly from the established lore and the tone of the Alien universe. Inconsistencies with the source material, poorly executed narrative elements, and lackluster character development detracted from the immersive experience promised, and it left fans feeling alienated and disappointed, if you'll forgive the term. If you go to the avp.fandom.com, they actually have a list, and I'll supply it down in the comments, of a series of just goofs and mishaps and continuity errors that simply just detach this from the actual lore of the alien universe. One of the items that were on the docket when it came to making this game happen and staying true to the franchise was making sure the aliens kept that territorial hunter behavior. In order to do this, they, and by they I mean Gearbox, boasted uh, advanced enemy AI and dynamic encounters with uh, Xenomorph intelligently adapting to the player's tactics and creating tense, unpredictable gameplay moments. They promised the idea that these would be advanced enemies that would learn and follow you and stay unpredictable at every step of the way. Now this was the promise, however, what we got was obscenely worse. Uh, in practice, enemy AIs exhibited glaring deficiencies with Xenomorphs often behaving erratically and failing to provide a credible threat. Uh, dynamic encounters felt scripted and lacked the spontaneity promise, leading to a repetitive and uninspired gameplay experience. The videos sell themselves at this point. So something very interesting about the graphical power of Aliens Colonial Marines. Um, it was already promised based on the teasers to have stunning graphics and immersive atmosphere. Uh, faithfully recreating a lot of the set pieces that we know and love today. Uh, it wasn't so much the design itself, um, but upon release, players were dismayed by the subpar graphics and la lackluster atmosphere that failed to capture the tension and dread of the film franchise. And it was not because the lack of trying. Uh, instead, it was a lot of the times the graphics were accelerated and 
powered up by higher end computers that were less obtainable by the general public in order to make the demos look better for E3 and things of that sort. And so what ends up happening is a lot of consumers will see how good a game looks and Watchdog had done this as well uh, when it first came out. A lot of people see how good the game looks and once they finally get it on their console of choice they realize that it's not in fact anywhere near that. We're going to step down even lower and uh, I will tell you that a lot of the graphics were swapped out entirely for low resolution graphics which which showed it was quite evident a lot of layers and textures and things like that took a serious nosedive after the fact and when consumers pur purchased the game they quite literally got the lowest resolution version it was almost as if they had set the graphics to lowest possible just to get the game rolling on board and good to go in the aftermath of its release aliens colonial marines became emblematic of the disparity between the promises made during its marketing campaign and the releases or realities of its execution. Gearbox Software faced widespread criticism and backlash from both fans and critics alike, with many citing the game's failure to live up to its own hype as a significant factor of its underwhelming reception. Despite its flaws, Aliens Colonial Marines serves as a cautionary tale of the dangers of overpromising and underdelivering in the gaming industry. Its legacy endures as a reminder of the importance of managing player expectations and maintaining transparency in game development, less developers risk alienating their audience and tarnishing their reputation, of course. Now let's delve into the most infamous cases of Promises Unfulfilled, No Man's Sky. This title soared onto the scene in 2016 promising players an unparalleled universe of exploration and discovery. But as many of you might remember from the countless YouTube videos and discussions that followed, one major promise stood out above them all. Multiplayer. This one is going to actually just be one major example. Uh, we've seen plenty of videos already about what they've missed, what they promised, what they didn't fulfill. But the biggest and most egregious promise broken was in fact multiplayer. From the earliest trailers to interviews with the developers, multiplayer was touted as a cornerstone feature of No Man's Sky. Gamers around the world were captivated by the idea of traversing the cosmos alongside friends, sharing in the wonder of exploration and discovery. However, when the game finally launched, the reality of multiplayer in No Man's Sky fell short from what was promised. Despite assurances from Hello Games, players quickly discovered that the chances of encountering another traveler in the vastness of space were slim to none. The shared universe that had been teased turned out to be nothing more than a solitary journey, with players exploring worlds devoid of any meaningful interaction with others. The backlash was swift and severe. YouTube became flooded with videos dissecting the discrepancies between the promised multiplayer experience and the isolated reality players encountered. Many felt betrayed by the false promises leading to a significant loss of trust in both Hello Games and the game's director, Sean Murray. In the aftermath, though, Hello Games scrambled to address the backlash, with Sean Murray acknowledging the issues surrounding multiplayer and vowing to improve the experience in future updates. But for many players, the damage had already been done. The broken promise of multiplayer in No Man's Sky served as a cautionary tale about the dangers of overhyping features and underdelivering on expectations. In my honest opinion, I believe the hype and the dreams and goals that Sean Murray, as well as his uh, company Hello Games, I, I truly believe they had the best intentions. I truly believe they were trying to make something great. But this is one of those examples of when your eyes are bigger than your stomach. Hello Games promised all of these wonderful things that could have absolutely revolutionized the way spacefaring could have gone, and we would have not had to wait all the way to, say, for instance, Starfield in order for us to really, really get that experience that was promised to be delivered. However, when your eyes are bigger than your stomach, you generally order more than you can take on. Their plates were full, and we watched as the company had a back and forth between the fan base for years, just trying to find some semblance of balance and something that would make both the fans happy and the developers themselves. 
Now, fortunately, I can say, despite all odds and adversity, Hello Games absolutely fought against the grain and made sure that they improved the game even after much of their fan base had left and they had to reclaim them again. And today, No Man's Sky is, is an amazing game. Uh, in terms of a survival game, it's one of the best. However, promises are not something that consumers take lightly. These are things that people wrap their money around, and now the money is scarcer than ever. You can't simply just expect them to just take your word for it. Games have now spiked to $70 to $80 a pop, and that's just the basic package. You really can't gamble with that. And Hello Games found out the hard way what happens when you gamble. They spent a good portion of the years after their game released simply backstroking and going upstream just to try to make something right again. I appreciate them for it, and it's definitely a success story in its own right. However, this is by far one of the biggest promises I've ever seen in a game that simply did not go through and was met with nothing but backlash. Folks, if you haven't yet, make sure you hit that subscribe button, make sure you hit the like button, leave a comment, all that good stuff. I'm trying a few different ideas out at the same time just to see what works for the channel, and so far it's been met with great and positive results. I cannot thank you enough. We finally hit 2,000 subscribers. We're really doing it now, making our stride, but I can't do it without you guys. So, pop into the comments, give me a little chat, figure out what's going on, or even better yet, pop over to Patreon or my Discord and have a chat with me there. And we can talk about how we can make this thing a little bit better, huh? In the meantime, this is Riot. You've been watching the Riot stream. And I'm getting the fuck out of Dodge. Later, guys. Hello, you.